Uh, congratulations to Caitlin Clark, who earlier tonight uh, got herself the record for uh, best career, uh, the uh, scoring record in women's college basketball. Just remember, she played in the COVID era as her as her uh, freshman season, where nobody was attending. And now she pretty much pretty much draws five digits a night in women's college basketball. That's amazing. Uh, guys, what do you think? Uh, Jay Kaplan, Anthony Stray, what do you think is the best thing about Caitlin Clark? Uh, I mean, I think the, the way she's just captured the, the eyeballs of pretty much the entire country. Uh, I mean, obviously it started last year with Iowa's run. Um, but I think the fact that, you know, college women's college basketball was starting to inch its way up, up, up into the, you know, into the consciousness, um, of the, of the sports love and populace. Um, but I think she, because of what she's, she did last year and her pursuit of this record this year, it's kind of kept the eyes on it and it's kept building it. And, uh, and the fact that, you know, we're, we're, we're seeing, women's college basketball get almost the same you know tv exposure that the men's game is getting that's a huge step in, in the right direction uh to put it all practically on par i mean they're even being allowed to use march madness for the women's tournament now which i think is awesome um i mean these aren't just female basketball players. Caitlin Clark's not I, a women's college basketball player. Caitlin Clark is a basketball player. That's yeah, that, for that, you. That, that for you, that's brief, by the way. So I'll take that. <laughs> yeah, I would say this, uh, as far as the the, the, the bigger picture of a women's college basketball, you think back to the the game between LSU and South Carolina and how that was a big ratings uh boost for not just ESPN, but but a women's game also, but going back to the Caitlin Clark, and I, and I had the game on earlier where she, she broke the record, and she did it in typical fashion, like a three-pointer from almost half court. Um, the threes, it's her thing. <laughs> yeah, and, and just the – and when you look at it like this and, and when you watch uh, Caitlin Clark play, it's almost like – you you it's almost like – it is like watching Steph Curry in, in a way and, and, and just – you you just fan about how good she she is and and you you just can't take your you don't know what what she'll do next. I mean because it's it's not just uh the fact that she's such a a phenomenal three point shooter. She is literally a playmaker. She's a ball player all around. And you look at uh Iowa's fortunes pretty much lives and dies with Kitten Clark. Like she is that she is literally so much in tied to that team, but what she's been able to help bring, uh, bring the attention to that program, um, that's that that is something that uh, that's definitely going to be left behind. Uh, has she you know, obviously takes the, the next step forward, which I, I would assume more likely be the, the WNBA uh, at some point. But mm -hmm. um, to, again, like I said, I I till then, uh, okay. yeah, a lot of people. Yeah, I, yeah I no, 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 no. It was uh, happy to see it, and um, yeah, like I said, I can't. Right. Like, it, it's a, it's a great day for women's women's sports. All right, guys. Um, so you can't see me. I'm Stephen Rabinowitz. Welcome to the latest <laughs> edition of On the Sports Lines. It's the NBA midseason preview. Uh, I have an idea. So, in honor of the Super Bowl that we just had this Sunday and the Nickelodeon broadcast. Tonight, we're going to have Dora the Explorer explain the concept of defense during the NBA All-Star Game. It should take about five seconds. But I was about to say, that's not going to really be a long work. conversation. <laughs> but I think Dora can actually do a better job than most of the people. I mean, she knows more about overtime than Kyle Shanahan does, which would be the ultimate. Uh, speaking of the NBA, it's time for our mid-season reviews. The locals, others, and why 65. Not three is the magic number. I love 65 is the magic number. It's my favorite song when I was a child. Okay. Uh, before we talk about the Super Bowl, we have to talk about, unfortunately, what happened during the uh, victory parade in yeah. Kansas City yesterday. And uh, many, it, 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 it's sad to see something like that happen. And uh, many people were shot. Uh, one person dead, two teenagers currently in custody. 
and uh, about 20 plus injured. Uh, everybody, the two juveniles that were uh, have been brought into custody about this. It's sad that this has to happen during a parade, a very good occasion, a very nice occasion, and uh, it just shows that stuff like this is really scary to see, and uh, just wanted to take some time to acknowledge that uh, before we started on today's show. Guys, thoughts before we move on? Yeah, go ahead. Um, it just, it really, did, what happened yesterday really just, um, two days, it puts a, a dark cloud on what was supposed to be uh, a joyous afternoon uh, for a city and a community celebrating the championship team, but also it's a, another sad reminder of so many things that's gone wrong, that is wrong in this country that we still have a long way to go to address. And, you know, it, it just, we, we, we cannot be numb to things like this to the point where it's just, Oh, here we go again. I mean, something has to be done. The unfortunate thing is, the people who can do something have been kind of slow trending and make it ha- making something happen. And uh, yes, there was just a, another sad reminder of what has become an all too common theme in this country. Yeah, you know, I mean, it, it, when I was reading the you know the stories that were you know on, on what happened. Um, it could have been a lot worse had this gone down any earlier during the festivities. Um, the the thing that jumped out at me though is that it was happened on the set was the 17th anniversary of the Parkland shooting. Um, can't believe Parkland's been that long. Uh, that seems yeah. weird to me. Um, but uh, Anthony, I, I agree with you 100%. Um, it it's been long past time where human life needs to matter more um, as much as, you know, certain groups in our society espouse the second amendment. um, And for the large portion of them, they do it incorrectly. Um, The first amendment is, and the first words of the first amendment, right to life. Um, followed by liberty and pursuit of happiness. And two of those things were on, you know, were on full display at the parade. You know, people live in life, enjoying life and pursuing happiness, you know, that comes from your town, a team in your town winning a championship. Um, though That right supersedes the right to bear arms. Um, and it's right. long past time that, The people who can, as Anthony said, the people who can do something in this country to, you know, bring down the amount of times that we have to read headlines like this. um, It's about time they stop slow footing it across both sides of the aisle. I think that's uh, absolutely agreed. And even if you do believe in the Second Amendment, something has to change. Not even being political, just saying you can't keep having stuff like this. It goes beyond that. It's about human life. Absolutely. All right. I'm going to try to lighten things up here as we do talk about the Super Bowl. Let's let's review the things around the Super Bowl that we saw on Sunday. Usher wore either no shirt or global gym gear during the (laughs) halftime show. Nickelodeon (laughs) explained overtime better than actually CBS could. Kevin Harlan had his annual calling of a streaker on the field. Taylor Swift chugged beer and then went from a blank tank top to extremely covered up in the end. And my favorite commercial ended up involving a, bo- a Boston boy band not named New Kids on the Block, Long Live the Dumb Kids. <laughs> also, we had the second ever overtime game in Super Bowl history, almost fulfilling outgoing CBS Sports exec Sean McManus' uh, joke because of how many bad Super Bowls that they've had that they were promised a double overtime game. They were literally one play away from that happening. Oh, yeah, and the Chiefs cemented the first back-to-back Super Bowls in 19 years after a 25-22 overtime victory over the San Francisco 49ers. Nicole Hardman, former Jet, always a Chief, though, made the game-winning catch and uh, didn't even know that the game was actually over. And Patrick Mahomes had his third Super Bowl MVP and has led into half of those games a grand total of zero times. 
I made a long-winded intro, but Jay, simply tell me this. Your main takeaway from Super Bowl L-V-I-I-I, which they tell me is 50. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it, it was uh, very enjoyable for the second year in a row, you know, watching the game together with you on Sunday at Nisa and Allen's house. Um, that's glad you guys are becoming part of that tradition. Um, that's a takeaway, but- yes. The the on the on the professional level, um, I mean, obviously the the you know the D word is being thrown around. You know, are the Chiefs now a dynasty? Um, the numbers would kind of say yes. You know, and after the Super Bowl, Mike Sando, who's the senior NFL writer for the Athletic, uh, wrote a piece about what the requirements should be for a team to be deemed worthy of dynasty status. And his criteria goes beyond simply the number of Lombardi trophies in a given time frame. And his pretty and the rest of that criteria, though it is included, the rest of that criteria pretty much matches my own. They are as follows and equate to dynasty level success over a sustained period of seasons. So winning at least three Super Bowls in five or more se- in a five or more season span. Second, owning the NFL's best regular season winning percentage in a period starting with the team's first Super Bowl winning season and ending with the final or most recent season. Three, reaching the conference title game more than half the time during that span. And then he went and compared the the, the the Chiefs of 2019-2023 to the three accepted dominant dynasty levels in in the NFL history in the Super Bowl era. That's the Steelers. 1974 to 1979, the 49ers from 1981 to 1994, and most recently the Patriots from 01 to 18. And, and think here, here's 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 the numbers. So think about this, guys. New England, those 18 seasons, they had 18 winning seasons. They led the NFL in winning percentage in that span, 764. 13 AFC title game appearances. They made it 13 out of 18 times. That's 72% of their seasons wound up at least as far as the conference title game, nine Super Bowl appearances, six Lombardi trophies. Next down San Francisco, 14 seasons, 13 of them are winning. Their only losing season was the three and six strike year uh, strike season in 82. Their winning percentage, 738 led the NFL in that span, nine NFC title game appearances in 14 seasons. That's 64% of their seasons ending up in that game. Five Super Bowl appearances, perfect record. Pittsburgh Steelers, six total, six seasons, six winning seasons, led the NFL winning percentage in those seasons at 767, five AFC title games. That's an 83% title game uh, making record. Four Super Bowl appearances, perfect record. These Kansas City Chiefs, five seasons, five winning seasons. Their 759 winning percentage is best in the NFL in that span. And that's when you take into account, they only won 11 games this year. Conference championship game appearances. They're a perfect five for five. Since Mahomes took over the starter, they have not failed to make the NFC, the AFC title game. They've when made it to the Super Bowl four times. They've won three. As someone who was raised on that Steelers dynasty of the 70s, led by Chuck Noll, Terry Bradshaw, John Stallworth, Lynn Swan, and one of the greatest defenses in NFL history, and had a metaphorical front row seat to the dynasties of the 49ers, led by Bill Walsh, Joe Montana, Steve Young, and Jerry Rice, and the Patriots, led by Bill Belichick, Tom Brady, and Rob Gronkowski. I'd have to say the Andy Reid, Patrick Mahomes, Travis Kelsey, Steve Spagnuolo Chiefs, who now have three Super Bowl wins in the last five seasons, highlighted by winning the last two back-to-back, or at least in the red zone of dynasty territory, if not all the way in the end zone. Numbers don't lie. Only you would compare the Pittsburgh, would give a Pittsburgh Steelers <laughs> shout out immediately during the podcast. Hey, they were I the first care. legitimate dynasty of the Super Bowl era, man. Technically, the Packers were the first ah, legitimate dynasty in the Super Bowl. Season. I said Super Bowl era. If that's you want to cross that's eras, still, do a pre cross era, that's Bowl different. And but... go into Super Bowl, then yes, the Packers definitely, the Lombardi, Bart Starr Packers definitely are, are, are part of that list. But this was specific to the Super Bowl era. Anthony, what's your takeaway from this game? Um, well, I'm going to go on the other side, and that's the 49ers. And the takeaway from this is, well, we're, we're kind of already seeing it. I mean, they fired defensive coordinator Steve Wilkes after one season. Uh, you're seeing teammates kind of infighting with each other on social media. 
uh, in in a in drunken stupor. Brandy Ayuk is uh him, his girlfriend, and his brothers throwing kind of subliminal messages out on social media that he he may be no longer be a forty nine in next season. Um, the 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 forty nine is writing the textbook on how not to react to losing the Super Bowl, but mm-hmm. at the end of the day, they, you think about it like this. This is one of the cleanest Super Bowls we've seen in quite a while. Six penalties uh, for each side, and, not, and none of the penalties were anything drastic or, you know, game altering like we nope. saw a, a year ago uh, between the Chiefs and the Eagles. But you look at the missed opportunities that the 49ers had in this game. I mean, they had the opening drive they get downfield, and, and uh, Christian McCaffrey, who has been money for the 49ers, puts the ball on the ground, and, and that's a lost opportunity to walk away with points. Um, they jumped out to a 10 nothing lead, and the offense stalled after a while. They they started the, the second half with three straight three and outs. Um, a, a muff punt where Ray Ray McDonald, for whatever reason, Decide to try to pick it up and run with it after the it ball. Hit off a, it, ha- it hit off a guy, though. Yeah. So he had hit, to off his, hit off one of yeah. his teammates' it foot. Up, it, so he didn't yeah, have a choice off, but to try and pick it up. The thing was, too, the thing was, too, when he tried to pick it up and run with it, and this is after the ball hit his teammate, I, the, the first thing I came to mind is, why did he just fall down? I mean, there's no way. At, at that point, he's going to pick it up and run with it and make anything out of, make something out of, when it's already a disaster, was a plane to say the least. But the the main thing was he should have fell down on it in the very next point. Kansas City scored a touchdown. They take the lead. Um, but even the over even um the overtime. You think the, about the the two. There was a couple of missed plays, missed passes that Brock Purdy, who played phenomenal, he played very, he played well enough to win the Super Bowl. I don't want to hear the Brock Purdy, uh, critics out there talking about. He lost the game, whatever not. He he played as well as you could have for a guy who was playing in his first Super Bowl, who was in his second year as a starter in the National Football League. And then and, and I'm talking about the, the two missed passes that probably would have gone for touchdowns had Chris Jones not been bearing down in his face in both occasions, which I, 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 I'm sorry, I have to tell the, the critics out there, this isn't John Madden football where you can see the entire field, all right? A guy six six, almost three hundred pounds, coming at you at full speed. They're not going to see guys wide open like you, th- like as if you're playing a video game. Nope. But when you, but the 49ers, you got to think of it like this now, long term, is the window of opportunity closing? I mean, this is a team that the last six postseasons they've even lost in the Super Bowl or lost in the NFC Championship game. I mean, you think That's about fine. the last. Uh, six- Five, four, five, out, of the, four out of the last five. The COVID yeah. year, they had a bad year. Yeah, six and ten actually. That uh, yeah. a mess. But um, you do want to win. The winning opportunity is closing because they're 40, 43 million over the cap next year. You know, Brock Purdy is going to be due for a big payday, so not they're yet. not going to be not, not yet, yet. But they're going to. They, they can't survive one more year on that rookie on that rookie contract. Yeah. Ironically enough, had he not been drafted. He All would right. have been like in line for an extension. One more pick. One more yeah. pick. But, I mean, you got the 49ers. And, again, uh, Kyle Shanahan getting the comparisons to the guy he just lost to, Andy Reid. Uh, remember Andy Reid was his time in the guy yeah. in time in Philadelphia who, who just couldn't get over the hump. And, I mean, this is more so than the loss of Super Bowl 54 four years ago. This one is, is the one that really – Gonna sting, uh, Dino fans for a long time because they had, and I talked about this uh, a couple of weeks ago uh, with Buffalo and Baltimore. You cannot give a team like Kansas City and especially a guy with Patrick Mahomes any opportunity to hang around. And the Forty ers had their chances at one point. I'm looking at my brother. I'm watching, my brother's out watching the game, and I'm looking at them like, don't it feel like the Forty ers should be up seventeen or twenty to nothing right now? Because they're moving up and down. That first half was everything that they needed. Yeah. Everything that they needed. Yeah. The defense was on point. The offense was able to move the ball downfield. But the Chiefs went into halftime only down one score. And that is one of the things that the the Niners are going to be kicking themselves in the offseason. How many opportunities they left on the field. 
that could have turned this game into a complete laugher by by the time Usher performed. But instead, um, you, you saw an all-time great quarterback with an all-time great performance and another comeback at the 49ers' expense. Uh, yeah, I want to go ahead real quick. To me, Rabbi, and um, – when you know when we we kind of traded text this morning about Wilkes getting um, relieved of his duties, uh, when I dug a little deeper into it, um, I did not realize how much of an uncomfortable fit Wilkes had been um, with this defense. I, I I did not realize that he was brought in to essentially continue coaching the same system that they had set up and had succeeded so well with previously under Robert Sala and then D'Amico Ryans. Um, the, the, the stars of this defense are their front seven. So that's kind of the focus of the scheme. Um, Wilkes is a guy who, despite his success as a defensive coordinator elsewhere, he's a defensive, he's a secondary. That's where he comes from, the secondary. And that's kind of been where his focus is. And his philosophies have tended to lean more on that than the front seven. So it apparently, and I didn't realize this, this was more awkward a fit than anyone realized. And apparently there had been some disconnecting communication, not being on the same page. Um, apparently that's Shanahan and the the timeouts that Shanahan yeah. called during the game wasn't was because he didn't like the defensive scheme that he saw out there on a particular down and distance. So I originally thought this was scapegoating, but it's still uh, scapegoating though. Because... It turns out this is just they Shanahan finally realized that the awkward fit he just couldn't allow it to continue. I read the same report though, and I do think that you had a lot of time. Ryan's got hired last year on January thirty first. If you wanted to say, I understand how much of a good coach Wilkes is, but if you're teaching on system, you have to get somebody in the Seahawks system, and that's the type of team they play is. And that's a, as you say, Jay, a dereliction of duty by yeah. Kyle Shanahan. It's something that we've realized. There are little flaws in Shanahan that are starting to semi come out in terms of, uh, by the way, I want to go back to something real quick about the San Francisco kind of meltdown this week. Mm. Anyone see the Sauce Gardner tweet? An no. innocent little tweet that says, and I, I, I'm serious. I am going to read this verbatim. I told y'all the Niners might look better on paper, but the Chiefs always find a way. That is a very innocent comment. Nothing meant to it. Hey, he would know. He played the he played the only this season. It's, it's, and he's <laughs> not know. saying well, anything okay. that Listen, the rest of no, us no, haven't no. already figured out. So here's the response that Charvarius Ward gave to this. Boy, your ass ain't sniff the playoffs. You watch it from the couch. Worry about the sorry-ass Jets. So you want to talk about a meltdown? That is a meltdown. Yeah, that that would okay. tend to be – an. Oh, that's someone who's taking it a little too personally. Yeah. It was, um, it's been a bad, because uh, that's, been a bad that, year. Sauce, as much as he tends to talk that trash – and and be provocative with things that was just some straight up football analysis right yeah yeah. and and it's talking from experience like did did we not see on tonight football the Chiefs find a way to win a game they were outplayed in the second half against this very jet team and and by the way Gardner was called for the for one of the holding penalties that aided the Chiefs in winning that game so he's talking from experience Okay, mm-hmm. uh, I do want to talk really quickly about one thing that kind of shocked me in this game. Um, I thought Steve Wilkes actually played a good defensive game. I know after the game, I think it was Nick Bosa in that same article that wrote, we were ready for Patrick Mahomes' runs, yeah. which is fine because, it's one of, as mentioned, he is one of the best quarterbacks coming out of the scramble. It actually led the team in rushing yep. this game by mm-hmm. nine carries. And as I said yards. to you during the game, Rabbi, Led the NFL in yards yeah. per, per per quarterback scramble this year. Yeah, and that's not something it's easy to prepare for. But what I like is the balance of the Chiefs going into this go in this game. Nine catches for Travis Kelsey for ninety three yards. Miko Hardman three for fifty seven. Justin Watson three for fifty four. Pacheco caught six passes. Rasheed Rice caught six passes. 
No, agree. The backup tight end caught two passes. Marquez Valdez Scantling, who I called getting a touchdown in the Super Bowl and never put any money on it, damn me, caught a touchdown. And Jarek McKinnon caught a touchdown. In all, a team that all year was just not on the same page offensively, it seemed like, with the pass catchers, they only missed six targets in the whole entire game. Debo Samuel, by himself, was targeted 11 times and only caught the ball three times. So if you want to say, I'm not blaming it on Brock Purdy or anything, I just think Patrick Mahomes is one of the best quarterbacks we've ever seen, and he found a way to get and the just Give credit to Andy Reid and Matt Nagy and that offense for kind of getting it together in these last few weeks, especially in this game specifically, because in the second half, everybody came to play. And that's one of the reasons why Kansas City for chance. And one other thing I want to mention real quick, I've actually gone back and forth this week in my head about what to do in overtime. And I've decided that Shanahan was wrong. I understand what Shanahan was trying to do in getting the ball third, but the fact that Andy Reid had made, that many people had basically said that the Chiefs were going to go for two if it was touchdown to touchdown. And I think that would have been a ballsy move, and I think it would have worked out. Kind of negates that idea for Shanahan. So honestly, if I was Kyle Shanahan, you take that ball second. So you have an extended playbook. You know if you have to go for it on fourth down, that gets you a few plays right there. And uh uh, Kyle Shanahan has yeah. now blown double-digit leads as an offensive coordinator and a coach in three Super Bowls Ooh. in the last eight years. Yeah, It's Ooh. going to be a stain on his resume that he is going to have to eventually... Yeah. By the way, yeah. did, you, did, did you see the NFL films of the refs actually saying they're going to take the ball? Really? <laughs> they literally said that, like, you give him Patrick Mahomes the ball going- second? I understand going third by the I understand going first in that situation because after the first two drives, anything else is there. But again, you have yeah, anything else wins the game, but again, you have to get to the third drive. And I don't think as I said to you, Rabbi, when we were talking about it after the game, sometimes guys who are as smart as Kyle Shanahan, sometimes they think way too much and they outsmart themselves. Again, it's not a terrible choice, but then when you realize no. that the Chiefs were going to go for two, it does become a terrible choice. And not that he could have known that. that from the get. You know, from he the, wouldn't have known but... that, but you do have to bring that thing up. Okay, right. moving on, and let's get to the midseason portion of our program, starting with the New York Knickerbockers. As a fan, there are so many emotions to this season, whether it be the fact that Jalen Brunson is taking his superstardom to another level, the team has one of the hardest working defenses in the league, or the fact that injuries have demolished this team over the last few weeks, and now this team has lost four straight. But at 33-22, and 22, there's one thing that you can't call the Knicks, and that is boring. They are <laughs> interesting to watch. So, Anthony, give me your first half takeaway from the team that currently stands in fourth in the Eastern Conference. We just mentioned it. Jalen Bronson is a bona fide star and an MVP candidate. I mean, uh, in just a year and a half, what he has done as far as on the court and helping the Knicks become not just a relevant team, but a team that could seriously be a threat in the East, in a certainly wide open Eastern Conference, um, because of what's going on with the teams around them in that in that standings. Um, it, it's really, you know, it, it really is something else. I mean, the night he was named an All Star for the first time, he scores forty against Indiana, and obviously. Uh, it's almost brought the tears in a post game interview uh, with the Clown Chen MVP. Uh, but we look at his numbers 27 a game, six and a half assists, close to four rebounds a game. And I mean, you look at those numbers, and one of the, and you, and one of the things that was asked about was can he be a number one? I mean, the stats kind of shows for itself, but the month of January is where he stood out the most. And the Knicks. Went 14 and 2 during the month, the best uh, month win loss record a month since March of 1994, the year they went to the NBA Finals. They actually finished 13 and 0 for the for the month of March uh, that season. Uh, he, he almost he averaged almost 30 a game, seven assists, 
um, and shot 61% from the field. And just 52 games this season, he, he scored 40 or more points five times. And he scored 30 or more points uh, in 20 uh, of those games as well. Um, and historically, looking at uh, if you want to get the big picture, uh, that's since Sky Pippen's plus 272 in November of 1996. Has you seen uh, a, a player have any game close to that? Jalen Brunson's plus minus for the month was a plus 256. That just tell you how important he was to the Knicks, has been to the Knicks success when he's been on the court. They got a scale where he uh, took his ankle, uh, and they were, the Knicks are very fortunate that it did not lead to any series or the team that already has enough injuries, to, to say the least. But, okay, yeah, and, and, and look, it's, uh, look, I will say this. I am a big Kenneth Parker fan. I love watching her play. I think she not is the greatest. Not the greatest. amazing. But I cannot disagree with her more when, uh, as far as what Jalen Brunson did last year in the playoffs against Miami. You can't say a guy who averaged 31 points a game, scoring close to 40 in the game six, in the deciding game six, and almost forces a game seven single handedly with an injured. Uh, with an injured Julius Randle and an uh, RJ Barrett that was in foul trouble in that game, uh, you can't look at that and say that he not that he played terribly in a series where he basically won two games by himself and almost forced the game seven. But um, like I said, Jalen Bronson, first time All Star, uh, it's been well deserved. The Knicks are in a in a prime position they're sitting fourth right now, where they can at the very worst have home court advantage in the first round of playoffs. They can move up in the conference, too, when you think about it. They're going to get healthy at some point. Uh, and, I'll, and, I'll set, uh, and I'll set you two guys up as well. They have some additional pieces, too. So the second half of the season should be a very interesting one for the Knicks. Uh, but they're going to need Jalen Bronson to continue to play the way he's been playing this season and for the last year and a half since he uh, signed that four-year contract uh, as a free agent. And Jay, you just mentioned uh, those additional pieces at the trade deadline. They have lost three straight since they started playing, but overall it's going to be a net positive, it seems like, once uh, everything is back to normal. Yeah, you know, I mean, and the the thing with the Knicks, um, yeah, I looked at the trades that they made, and, and I got to tell you, you know, this was probably, it may not have been uh, – a a, a trade deadline full of big swings and a lot of big names moving. Um, but there were a lot of deals that got made that definitively the improved some teams, not just short run in terms of, you know, getting players to fill needs, but, you know, solving salary cap issues, opening up options down the road. Um, and the Knicks were one of those teams where that fall under both of those, you know, the big trade was, um, you know, obviously Ananubi was the first one, but getting, you know, Bojan Bogdanovic and Alec Burks from Detroit um, and all they had to give up was Evan Fournier, Malachi Flynn, Quentin Grimes, Ryan Archie Diacono um, and a pair of second round picks. Um, I, I like this trade. It gives the Knicks two players in Alec Burks and Bojan Bogdanovic that really fit what they need now with the losses of, of Randall and Ananubi to injury, as well as down the road for the playoffs and possibly next season. And what they gave up was worth it. Sure, hurts to lose Grimes, but if that's the biggest loss, then I think they came out ahead here. I don't know if he has a bone spur irritation in his right elbow. Randall is still dealing with that nasty shoulder dislocation. Neither's played since the 27th of January. And when coupled with losing Isaiah Quick, you know, Manuel quickly in the trade to the Raptors, the Knicks were in a bit of a bind in terms of secondary scoring, playmaking, and quality depth off the bench. And coach Tom Thibodeau has been forced to play recently acquired Precious Achua, who was only supposed to play backup center minutes, an average of 40-plus minutes a night over the Knicks' last eight games since January 30 as Randall's primary replacement at the power forward spot, further decreasing the depth of the second unit. Without Randall's 24 points per game and Ananobi's 39.1% shooting from three, defenses have been able to gang up on all-star point guard Jalen Brunson and trap him unmercifully. The Knicks have lost five of their last six and have been held less than 110 points in four of those games. This trade solves these problems. 
Burks is back for his second tour of duty at MSG. He played 130 games across the 2020 uh, and 21 and 2021-22 seasons for the Knicks before they traded him to Detroit in the summer of 2022 to clear cap space so they could sign Brunson. And he brings a 40% three-point shooting along with solid secondary playmaking. He's been one of the better bench players in the NBA this season and automatically becomes the alpha of the Knicks' second unit. He's averaging a career-high 21.6 points per game over 36 minutes. Uh, similar to the 22 and a half points per game per 36 minutes quickly averaged prior to the trade. Burks is 59.2% true shooting percentage in two seasons with the piston is also in the same ballpark as quickly 59.8 true shooting percentage a season prior to the trade. Burks' skill set plays equally well, whether he plays alongside Miles McBride, who's been backing up Brunson at point guard since they traded quickly, or take over as the next primary backup point guard if Tibbs decides to cut his playoff rotation at the guard spots. Bogdanovich, though, this is the real get here for the Knicks. Straight up, this is a player who can shoot and score the basketball. In his last six full seasons from 2017-18 to 2022-23 across three teams, Indiana, Utah, and Detroit, he averaged 18 points a game on 46.7% from the floor, 40.4 from three on 5.9 attempts per game, and 86.6 on the line. And he does it efficiently with a 60.6 true shooting percentage and an effective field goal percentage that has been between 53.6 and 57.5, which were above the league average in five of those six seasons. Missed the first 19 games of the season, including the majority of Detroit's record 28-game losing streak due to a cast drain. But since his return to the Pistons lineup, he's averaged 20.2 points per game in 32.9 minutes, on 46.8% from the floor, 41.5% from beyond the arc on 7.4 attempts per game, and a tick under 78% from the line. His 60% true shooting percentage is slightly above his career mark. His 56.9% effective field goal percentage is well above his career mark. While Randall is out, now he'll be evaluated and reevaluated in two to three weeks, Bogdanovich slots right into the starting power forward slot and will give the Knicks a legitimate option, scoring option at the four. The rebounding and playmaking will have to be picked up by others as neither are really part of the combo forward skill set. He's only averaging 3.4 boards and two and a half dimes per game. What will be interesting is how Tibbs sorts out the minutes at both forward spots. Uh... Once among Bogdanovich, Josh Hart, Randall, and Anunoby, once the latter two are healthy. Now, that's a nice problem to have, though, right? Trading for Burks and Bogdanovich will ultimately give the Knicks one of the better, deeper eight-man rotations come playoff time, and they were able to get both of them plus Anunoby without giving up any of their first-round picks. Yeah, Grimes has developed beyond his number 25 draft pick spot, but his role shrunk this season uh, as things progressed, and as Dante DiVincenzo claimed more and more of the available perimeter minutes, before moving into the starting lineup, I just ran a heat check. And we all, I mean, we all talked about uh, Dante's heat check, but over the last eight games, since he's had to step up and play major minutes, he's averaged a little over 40 minutes per game. He's averaging 26 and a half points per game on a little under 46% from the floor, a little under 40% from three, 75% from the line. He has been on fire. Um, so, I mean, there, it, it kind of made Grimes somewhat, I don't want to say irrelevant, but it definitely made it less of a pain point to trade him. Uh, he only had one year left on his rookie deal. So, as I said at the top, giving him up was a small price to play for everything the Knicks got back with this move. Yeah, uh, this is a very interesting team. By the way, Randall was reevaluated on the second for the two to three weeks. So, that's going to probably be a little bit of a post all-star uh, timetable. Brandon will probably be back before Ananobi, whose mm -hmm. elbow injury kind of uh, snuck up on a lot of people there. That wasn't a, that was a sustained injury, but that was kind of kept quiet and was just suddenly out one night and hasn't been out and hasn't been there since. He'll probably be, for I think Nick Spence, the hope is probably going to be the beginning of March in that situation. That's the key second half key for me. Get healthy. Because there's going to be a lot of people in this rotation once everybody is back. Mm -hmm. Jericho Sims, who played 39 minutes last night, not what you want, uh, is probably not even going to play a lot. Because Precious Achuba has been a revelation in terms of, yes, he has been playing above his pay grade. So is Dante DiVincenzo, who's also injured, by the way. He should be back post-All-Star game, probably ready for that game against Philadelphia, which will be next Thursday. 
Uh, that's the big issue right now for the Knicks. It's just health, health, and health. Because eventually, the, the injuries were going to get to them. So Isaiah Hartenstein, Dante DiVincenzo, and Boyan Bogdanovich will be probably back right after the All-Star break. Randall probably comes next after that, I would say, probably about a week or two after if all has done well. If he is ahead of schedule, uh, people have said on his rehab. Then OG, because I think with OG, the best thing is with him is you have somebody who is just a lockdown defensive player and somebody who can guard every position. And that is something that you can rarely see in the NBA these days. Plus, he can give you 14 to 15 points as well. Uh, and then, of course, uh, Mitchell Robinson has a chance to be back by the end of the season. Initially, they had uh, tried to use, uh, tried to find a way to use a trade exception or use a fully guaranteed exception this year. They didn't find that, but he is getting better quickly. And having Cam and Hartenstein, who's also injured, by the way, will be a very good one-two combination at that spot. Uh, the question is, what do you do with this team? Do you want to make a push? To a higher seed, they right now the what you want to do is stay above this six line, because right now Boston is the standard in the East. And really after that, it's just a muddled bunch of fish. Immediately after that, so they're three games ahead of that cut line, which is the Miami Heat at seven, and that's what I'm wanting to see what the Knicks want to do in terms of getting everybody healthy and getting everybody on the same page. I think there still needs to be a lot of working everybody together because. I love the Burks trade. I love the Bogdanovich trade. Neither are known as great defensive players, and that's going to be an issue going forward. It's going to be because at the end of the day, the best line that the Thibodeau is going to want out there at crunch time is probably the one that's going to make the most stops. And it's really a combination of do you want your scoring or do you want your stops late? And that's going to have to be what – Thibodeau is going to have to do. And, but it doesn't involve Jacob Toppin and Charlie Brown Jr. getting minutes. That can't <laughs> happen anymore. And hopefully after the All-Star break for the Knicks sake, that won't need to happen. Although Jacob Toppin will, will be in this this Saturday's dunk contest and I won't be putting money on him. <laughs> Just letting you know that. All right. I want to move on to the Nets because we're contractually obligated to. Yes, we are. Just Ooh. over a year ago, the Nets were hoping to make a new start. They finally broke away from their big three, tried to get pieces without losing too much credibility as an Eastern Conference contender. They were ended up being the sixth seed of the playoffs last year, lost in four, lost in this sweep to Philadelphia. And then this year, just like the Knicks, they started out 13 and 10. They had the same record in December. Since then, though, 8-23 and 23, and the Nets are kind of finally possibly hitting the growing pains that a lot of people had expected them to hit post-Big 3. Anthony, the last 31 games, there's not a lot of good takeaways here, but I didn't ask you for a good takeaway. I asked <laughs> you for a takeaway in this first half of the new Brooklyn Nets. I was about to say the New Jersey Nets. They deserve to go back to Jersey after this. <laughs> After we saw them three falls ago in Boston, they deserve to go back to Jersey. That was embarrassing under any circumstances. You can't lose a regular season game by 50. That, that's, that's, that, that just cannot happen. At all. Lose by 50, by the way, to a team without its second best player in Jalen Brown. Just a reminder of that. Yeah. Um, well, the, the, the takeaway for me um, is going to be is Mikael Bridges, the guy you want to build around, has a number one. I mean, I, I, uh, Mikael Bridges, look at his, his, his stat line. He's averaging 21.8 points per game, a little under five rebounds. Um, could have make the you make the case that he could have been an all star this season had the Nets had a better record and maybe not had so many guards uh, in the Eastern Conference having good having career seasons to say the least. But um, when you look at uh, look at Mikael Bridges though, he's also shooting. Uh, just under forty five percent, which is actually a career low, uh, for him, and he's and, and when you look at the the makeup of this net team, and, and Bridges obviously was one of the bigger pieces from last year's trade deadline and the uh, the Kevin Durant deal that sent him to Phoenix. Um, Bridges at times has shown that he is he can embrace being the 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 the, the go to guy in offense and. And can and obviously one of the better two way players in the league. He's a great defender and can score. The the problem is on on a 
normal team, is Bridges a number one or a number two or a number three option? I mean, you look at the Knicks, this is something that you had to ask for Julius Randle. And it was he really soon to be a, a one or a two? Um, when you look at uh, Bridges' contract, it's, it's very uh, contract-friendly, um, I mean, team-friendly contract. And the, the Nets have actually rejected several uh, trade offers, particularly from the Rockets and the Pelicans in recent weeks um, uh, for, for Bridges uh, for the rest of the season. So they seem very convinced that they can build around him. And obviously, you have talent when you have when you look at the likes of uh, a Cam Thomas, even a Cameron Johnson, guys who can who can score, and a, and a young uh, shot blocker, uh, shot blocker, rim protector, and Nick Claxton. So the the young pieces, the, the the pieces are there. You just wonder if Bridges the the the, the main piece, or should he be uh, an additional piece, and you try to go for something else, and, and that is, um. Something that the Nets are going to have to figure out the rest of the season because the the only two games out of the final plans tournament spot, but this team would just look look the the best win of the season by far was when they went into Los Angeles and and blew out the Lakers on national television. But outside of that, there were several games during the month of January, even one against the Knicks at home, where they just didn't know how to to hold a lead, and, and you wonder if they were able to figure out. Some of how to win those games. Um, if they if we're looking at the Nets, totally different going into the All Star break. Um, and, and look, I said this before. Jock Vaughn has the team that he probably feels more comfortable coaching. Uh, a gritty, hardworking young team that that can be competitive on a given night. Uh, last night being an exception, but at the same time, we are seeing like. Right by saying we're seeing the growing pains with this team that we kind of expected after you know a solid start to the season, and, and Bridges has had his moments when he's been non-existent on the stat sheet too. Like he's gone, he'll go for 29 30 one night and then go four for thirteen the very next night. So also with being with the with being the number one, you gotta be more consistent, and, and that's where the questions are going to keep bouncing up uh, each time he has a game like. Uh, last night where he did play well, follow up by the previous game where he actually scored the uh, 29 points and, and lead the Nets uh, in scoring. So, you know, Mikael Bridges is still one or is he less than that? That's going to be something that the Nets are going to have to solve the, the remaining 25 plus games left in the season. I want to talk about where the Nets stand in just a moment at my angle, but Jay... The trade deadline, the Nets got rid of a lot of people. Spencer Dinwiddie is now a Laker because Man, of all of home. this. Who says, you, who says you can't go home? Uh, I mean, that's that's a much better home. Uh, Jay, give us a quick uh, <laughs> recap of what they did. Yeah, you know, I mean, uh, the 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 big uh, – Dinwiddie's the big name that, you know, that they kind of moved on from. Uh, Royce O'Neal was the lesser name that they moved on from. And, Still a name. Uh, and I'm not quite sure what to make of these two deals by the Nets in terms of how how much they actually move the needle for a team that's two and a half games behind Atlanta for the final playing spot in the East. Granted, getting any decent return for forward Royce O'Neal, who was brought to Brooklyn at the expense of a 2023 first round pick in the first place to help Kevin Durant on the wing and now goes to Phoenix for the same reason. Uh, you know, anything you get from him could be considered an accomplishment. But a trio of second round picks and a pair of minimum salary role players in combo forward uh, Kaida Bates Diop and combo guard Jordan Goodwin in exchange for a player who is a career 38.2% three point shooter on average volume and merely capable at defending on the ball as well as helping as well as help situations. <sighs> Uh, both Bates Diop 33.6 and Goodwin 30 point at are below NBA average three point NBA average three point shooters and both do it on low volume and neither one has a career true shooting percentage or effective field goal percentage that screams give them a larger role in anyone's rotation. Uh, Bates Diop is at 56 and a half uh, and 53, which is above awful. And Goodwin is just 51.1 and 48.1, which is below awful. Um, I'm not sure how either player improves the Nets chances to make the play in tournament. 
Uh, the Dinwiddie for Schroeder deal, which is a swap of 30-year-old starting caliber point guards, is the more interesting of the two Brooklyn trades. Uh, according to sources, Dinwiddie, who is averaging 12.6 points per game, six assists one, uh, against only 1.3 turnovers in 30.7 minutes on 39.1% from the floor, 32% from three on 5.8 attempts, 5 attempts per game, and 78.1% from the line with the Nets this season all below his career marks as were his 53 flat true shooting percentage and his 48 flat effective field goal percentage, uh, he'd become disgruntled with his role and he wanted out. Schroeder, who was solid this season with the Raptors prior to the trade, 13.7 points per game, 6.1 dimes against only 1.6 turnovers in 30.6 minutes, uh, on 44.2% from the floor, 35% from three on a little over four attempts per game, 85.2 from the line, all are higher than his career marks, as was his almost 56% true shooting percentage and 51.1 effective field goal percentage. But he was having some issues in the locker room, and with the Raptors having added Emmanuel quickly in that in an earlier trade with the Knicks, he became somewhat expendable. So there is a change of scenery element on both sides of this trade. Schroeder gives the Nets an upgrade at the starting point guard spot in terms of being a playmaker, and he's been a more efficient scorer, as evidenced by the numbers I just ran for you, which should make him a better fit with Mikael Bridges, Cam Thomas, and Cameron Johnson on the offensive side of the ball. The point guard swap does make the Knicks significantly smaller at the position on the defensive end as Schroeder, while a decent defender, he's just 6'1", 172 pounds, while Dinwiddie was a solid 6'5", 215. And for a team like the Nets that per second spectrum leads the NBA and switches on the pick and roll, this could become an issue. Dinwiddie switched on 39% of the pick and roll plays where he defended the ball handler with the Nets, whereas Schroeder switched on just 22% of the pick and roll plays where he defended the ball handler while with the Raptors. Overall, these trades would appear to be a wash to a certain extent. Schroeder's a net positive, but Bates, Diop, and Goodwin are net negatives. The Nets moved on from players who were not likely to be part of their future, got a slew of future second-round draft picks and a pair of trade exceptions that could help them improve the roster down the road, such as being able to use the projected $12.9 uh, million non-taxpayer mid-level exception to retain center Nick Claxton, who's become a solid double-double producer this season for Brooklyn, 12.2 points per game, 10.2 boards. But as I said at the top, I I'm not sure how much they moved the needle for a team that's lost six of their last eight, been held to a hundred under a hundred points in three of those losses, and is at the fringes of the playing round. Remember when I said that the Knicks aren't boring in the last in the first segment? Well, the Nets are exactly the opposite. They are boring. <laughs> I don't. A lot of people do not go to Barclays to see this team. They might be a nice homegrown team, but right now there's just no juice in this team. And uh, mm. I want to talk about a few things in a second. Um. Number one, their play-in spot. I don't know what this team would do even if they ended up getting the 10th spot in the play-in. It might be a builder for the future, but at 21 and 33 and in win percentage under 400, uh, it, I mean, yes, once you're in the dance, you're in the dance. I mean, and the teams that they're chasing, Atlanta at 24 and 31 and Chicago at 26 and 29, both of them are also failed exper uh, experiments. At least Chicago mm -hmm. is trying a few new things with their team with the success of Kobe White this year in Chicago. I, I just don't. I, I know I said to you, hey, all playoffs, all, all play in the playoff spots are created equal. Everything uh, You have to fill in 20 teams for the playoffs. For Brooklyn, I just don't know what their goal is, even if they do end up at the 10th spot. I think they needed to do a lot more last year when they blew the thing up, I know that they wanted to keep their spot. They wanted to at least get themselves to the playoffs out this year. They did that. They did that well. But right now, because of the James Harden trade that they made, their draft picture is still pretty bleak. They do not have a draft pick this year. It is a terrible draft, though. So this might be the year that you're okay with that. But no new players. They have a first and a second next year. But that first comes from Phoenix. And sure, it has no protections. But I don't think it's going to be a top 15 pick. More so likely it'll be in the mid-20s. They don't have a first round pick in 26. They have two in 27, which is a big help, including a protected one through eight from Philly. But it's just a very barren landscape right now for the Nets. They don't they're really stuck in that horrible place that you want to be, where the Knicks were, by the way, for many years, just in purgatory. 
that purgatory of maybe we can make the play in or maybe we tag for a very big prospect. There is no big prospect right now, and there's no pick to tag for in 2024. So the real question is, how do you rebuild the roster? And honestly, you can't stay in the middle all of the time. They're probably going to have to tear stuff down to build up. I think Nick Claxton is going to be very expensive to keep, but he has, he's going to provide a help to a lot of other teams so they will overpay. And also, when you pay these guys, you have to want them to come there. And the way Brooklyn is building themselves right now, you're going to have to throw extra money at them. And if that gets matched, you're going to watch players go. You have to build a winning culture right now. And the mediocrity that this team has had below mediocrity is just not going to cut it. It's it's a hard thing to say, but I think it's completely 100% true. And this is a hard thing in the NBA. That middle ground is tough. Yeah, and I would say this too with Sean Boston. He's trying to replicate uh, the the, the next team that we saw in 2019 that did have a good successful season and made the playoffs, but that was following two losing seasons. Um, so there's a, it's a lot of growing pains that's going to be done in Brooklyn. And the only thing I want to say, too, is they should wear white uniforms at home more often. For whatever reason, the white at home just pops more. But outside of that... The, the, don't the understand that, how many times I've heard this, by the way. It's at yeah, least six or seven. Because it's so true. But at the same time, Looking at the Brooklyn Nets right now, just, just, there's no, there's nothing exciting about this team. Nothing there. There's just I nothing mean, you go, there. You go to the, you go to the Barclays Center and you see that the, the buzz, uh, for a neck game, there's just no juice still. There's just not, there was literally nothing. And there was, like, I see more anticipation for the Ringling Brothers Circus coming into town <laughs> this week coming up, uh, next week coming up, than, uh, a Brooklyn Nets regular season game. It, it is, you know, it is what it is. I mean, I, I think the Nets, they, 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 went, they went for the whole run swing, bringing in uh, the big three. It didn't work out. They realized that they had to start over. But this is something that I, I know the front office, even over Joe's side, had to had to expect. You knew that seasons and situations like this was going to come arise, and now you have to kind of pick and choose what exactly are you going to take from the rest of the season. Mm-hmm. And it's really what what do you want to do with this team going forward? And that's and one thing that is interesting enough is when teams are rebuilding that keeps players around longer. Like you said before, Jock Vaughn is a team, but he can build with this team. He's not worried about his head getting chopped off most of the time. And that it, it, it's a very interesting situation, but it's also a very boring situation. If that makes any sense. All right, I was told that there are twenty eight other teams in the NBA. So let's go around the NBA by each conference. The Eastern Conference has had one dominant team this year, and that is the, uh, I believe, now 40-12 and 12 Boston Celtics, who, when they have had their preferred lineup, a.k.a. one with Chris Stops Porzingis, they're pretty unstoppable. I know the playoffs could be a different story, but right now they are the class. Well, we have supporting players in this game, the surprises of the Cavs and the Knicks, to the semi-declines of, I know your team is from injury, but the Sixers, the Bucks, and the Heat. So, let's start and see which players we like the best in this little play. Anthony, give me an East team on the rise. Uh, you know what? Well, it's got to be the Cleveland Cavaliers. Uh, eight Absolutely. Winners of 18 of the last 20 games. Go Flashback to December. Uh, and they were 12-12. and 12. They were struggling. Uh, and Coach Brickenstaff is on the chopping block. And since then, they've gone 24 and 5. They're one of the best defensive pl- teams in the league. Actually, they, they are the best defensive team. Oh, they are the best defensive team in the, in the league. league as far as defensive rating. Uh, they've held eight teams under 100 points per game during this 18, this, this streak of 18 to 20, 20, uh, 18 wins out of 20 games. They didn't have Evan Mobley and Darius Garland. For much of that stretch as well, mm-hmm. which has been even more impressive, they get both those guys back. Uh, and of course, you you can't miss the cast while talking about uh, David Mitchell having another All Star season, fourth in the league in scoring at twenty eight and a half a game. He's uh, averaging just under six and a half assists, but also his defensive shields is two point six into the top fifteen. So he is also doing it. 
on both sides of the of the court, which has been big for Cleveland because one of the biggest criticisms of David Mitchell has been for as good as he was offensively, he does it, it does kind of hurt you uh, on the defensive side of the basketball. That has been completely different, a uh, change co- considerably uh, this season. And, and the Cavs are one of only two teams to have winning streaks of eight games or longer. Um, so they have just really toned it on and toned it on. And look at the second half of the season; they're gonna have a really soft schedule. They just played. They just played Chicago last night. They'll play them again. Uh, a couple of other sub five hundred teams. They have a chance to really distance themselves as the number two team in the in the Eastern Conference and set themselves up nicely for a a, a first round matchup uh, with whoever survives the playing tournament at the seven. But then we look at the Boston Celtics. I know the Boston Celtics have been the the standard, they have been kind of the, the, the blue blood in the Eastern Conference in the first half. But when you see them have a game like they did a couple weeks ago against a Liga team with no Anthony Davis, no LeBron James, and Austin Reeves goes off for a career night, those are the kind of games you think to yourself, uh, are you really, are we really sold on this Celtic team like we think we should be? Um and, and Cleveland being such a good defensive team, it, it almost like they, they they take away one of the strengths that the Celtics are, are not even that one of the the habits of, of of settling for too many outside three point shots. Does and, and the Cavs are one of the better defensive teams. So you look at it from a uh, long, uh, kind of a a, a long term focus. This Cavs team is really it, it, as they get healthier. Has to become more and more defensive presence, and you obviously Mitchell being Donovan Mitchell as they work uh, Garland and Mobley and more into more of a of a of a ball offense that is seeing more ball movement, less one on one isolation. Um, that this, this Cleveland's going to be a could be a, a really Scary team if they get they get to separate themselves and set themselves up as either two or three, uh, in the Eastern Conference. There are so many interesting things about this Cleveland team. I'll give you the good right now. I think Donovan Mitchell is playing at an MVP pace this year, and I think uh, I wouldn't be surprised if, God forbid, Jokic gets injured at any point, or if uh, Shai Gilgis Alexander falls off a little bit, then Mitchell finds himself mm-hmm. as a top two or three MVP candidate. This is a guy who I would bet my house would not have been in Cleveland at the end of next, at the end of this season or at, going into next season. And now he might've built a steady uh, firm base there. Uh, number two, and the one thing that I think is interesting, you said how Boston, we are not sold on them. Just remember what Cleveland did against the Knicks last year. And it's virtually the same team. And that is another reason. One of the reasons why Brick staff was on the shopping block. And that's something I want to see going forward. And I think the one thing that they've done in this streak now, hold on a second, is uh, they've decided that Jared Allen is probably the better answer at center than Evan Mobley is. And that's going to be something I think going forward that I'm going to be very interested to see. Jared Allen's maturity, he could have been as limited all-star this year himself. Yeah. By the way, the idea of Victor Stapp being on a chopper block, it came after a blowout loss in early this season against the Nick team that Sent them home last in the playoffs, but yeah, you're right. Um, Jared Allen at center is just more of a fit. Mobley, I, I think they were trying to play him at the five and, and try just to get not, him. He's still it, just not a good offense. thing. He's, he's, he's a fool, without question. All right, uh, Jay, it is your task to tell me what team did the most at the trade deadline a couple about a week ago, and uh, let me know. Uh, I mean, ironically enough, um. <laughs> It's it's the Philadelphia 76ers, as, as funny as, as that may sound, um, in terms of most improved, because the Sixers added skills um to fill, you know, to fill to improve areas around Tyrese Maxey and Joel Embiid. Um and you know, they improved also improved their cap situation. So, because remember, you know, everybody everybody wants to talk about. Uh, you know the the cap, you know the uh, the trade deadline in terms of you know players you brought in, but for front office guys, it's also about how you position yourself 
for the buyout market after the trade deadline, how you position yourself down the road and into next year with changes to your roster. Sixers actually took care of all of that. Uh, and it might sound funny or, or that the Sixers fan won out over the OTSL NBA analysts, especially with the reigning MVP and franchise center Joel Embiid out for the foreseeable future as he recovers from knee surgery. But the moves that the Sixers made have actually positioned them well, not only for when Embiid returns, which is possible, well, no more in four weeks when the doctors reevaluate him, but for down the road to further improve the roster around Embiid and first-time All-Star guard Tyrese Maxey. I'm going to go in reverse here and start with the three moves made on February 8th to improve the Sixers' salary cap situation and how that worked out. They sent guard Patrick Beverly to the Milwaukee Bucks for guard Cameron Payne in a 2027 second rounder plus a trade exception. They sent forward Daniel House and a 2024 second rounder to the Detroit Pistons for a 2028 second round pick plus a trade exception. They traded Jaden Springer to the Boston Celtics for a 2024 second rounder plus, yep, another trade exception. These moves not only got the Sixers out of the luxury tax, which A, gets them a share of this year's tax distribution, projected to be around $11.5 million minimum per team after the post-trade deadline signings are factored in, but two, means they won't be subject to the repeater tax next season. Trade exceptions allowed them to acquire point guard Kyle Lowry in the buyout market, giving Maxi a legitimate backup. Lowry should be a great fit, and yet you can't discount the, the connections. He's a Philly guy, born and raised, played his college ball at Villanova, was an all-star point guard on Nick Nurse's 2019 NBA title-winning Raptors team, and was acquired from Memphis by Daryl Morey when he was running basketball ops in Houston. Sixers got a veteran leader who can still play to back up and mentor Maxi. Lowry started 35 of the 37 games he played for the Miami Heat, averaging 8.2 points four dimes and three and a half boards in 28 minutes per game before he was traded to Charlotte and then waived. According to Keith Smith of Spot Track, Lowry ga gave up 1.138 plus million in his buyout agreement with the Hornets, which is the exact amount he'd receive on a prorated minimum salary deal for the rest of the season. Though per Woj from ESPN, it looks like Lowry's deal with his hometown team will be in around 2.8 million leading folks to believe it'll come out of the 76ers full non-taxpayer mid-level exception which Maury was able to preserve because of the other moves but obviously the big move was the three-team trade that sent out Marcus Morris Sr. and Furkan Korkmaz plus cash and second round picks to the Spurs and Pacers respectively and brought back Buddy Heal shooting guard Buddy Heal from the Pacers granted Heal won't solve any of the solve any of the front court issues the Sixers are dealing with while Embiid is out They've lost five of seven since he went down and are 4-12 overall in games he's missed. But the sharp shooting guard will improve one of the Sixers' biggest weaknesses, three-point shooting. Their 36.1% from beyond the arc is 21st in the NBA, and their 31.5 attempts from beyond the arc per game is 25th. Hield was shooting 38.4% from three on 6.9 attempts per game and was averaging 12 points per game, largely due to his playing time dropping to 25.7 minutes per game after being at 31 last season. His minutes have increased since coming to Philly. It's up to 39 per game in four games, and the increased playing time has seen his numbers increase to 45% from three on 10 attempts per game, and his points per game jump up to 22.3 with the Sixers. He's a proven perimeter scorer who shot 40.1% 40, 40 from three on 7.7 .7 attempts per game for his career, and has a per 36 minutes points per game scoring average of 19.4. Now, Maxi will be scoring option number one for Philly while Embiid is out. And while both Tobias Harris and Kelly Oubre have shown themselves to be capable scorers, they're not big three-point threats. Harris is at 34.6 from three on 3.4 tries per game. Oubre, 32.6 from three at 4.6 attempts per game. The actual, the only other six are shooting above 36% on any type of volume Besides Maxi at 38% on 8.1 attempts per game and Embiid at 36.6 on 3.3 attempts per game was DeAnthony Milton, who was at 36.3 on 5.8 attempts per game before he got hurt in the middle of January. So getting healed not only fills Milton's hole in the lineup, at least offensively, but it was it, but actually improves it as he's the type of shooter from beyond the arc that other teams always have to account for. Can the Sixers stay above water, meaning out of the play-in until MB gets back? Who knows? If they can, then Heald will make them a much better team come playoff time, especially once Melton and Nick Batum return, regardless of whether he stays as whether Heald stays as a starter or moves to a six-man role, which might actually be the best fit. Till then, all he can do is try and pick up some of Embiid's scoring slack. 
Oh, and the Sixers have he have Heald's full bird rights. So even though he's in the final year of his current contract, he may turn out to be more than just a rental. All in all, a well done trade deadline by the Sixers. And a needed trade deadline by the Sixers, because yeah. as much as I say all the Knicks injuries, the biggest injury of any player is the guy who could have easily been an MVP, who was playing as the MVP this season. And uh, it's a tough break, uh, but we'll see how it the is. Sixers get it. It's uh, they, they have a chance to make it run. Yeah, I mean, they're, they're still in the top six. Yeah. yeah, they're still, still in the top, top six. six they they're, don't they're have that five spot right there. now, 32 and 22. You know, yeah, but, they're they're gonna so, have to throw, they're gonna have to tread water a little bit though. Yeah, that's uh, the that's literally the that's literally the description, Rabbi. They will have to figure out a way to tread water until Embiid gets back. Okay, so the theme before you, before you yeah. go, Rabbi, I have to set you up for this. Your team on the decline just lost to a Memphis team that's literally playing guys on the street. I just want you to set you up for that. I know. Well, you you know, can actually, you know, let me say that thought uh, instead of just setting me up for that. But uh, yeah, I but that. I just wanted to have I, I wanted to have a little fun with Wait, this wait, wait, hold, hold, hold up, before. Anthony. So that you're, you're saying that when you know Memphis introduces its starting lineup of late, how many guys are, are are instead of saying what college they come from, are saying off the couch? They're not off the couch. So let's be clear. <laughs> Memphis has actually been a decent team. Actually, I will say that they've been very competitive. Uh, yes, they beat uh, Milwaukee as today. competitive as you, as you can be as a 19 and 36 team. But again, this is a team that was kind of really bad to begin the year. They actually almost have a winning record on the road. Okay, with that being said, let's talk really quickly about the <laughs> team I have on the decline, and that's the Milwaukee Bucks with the talent that they have. And I think at least one of us picked them to make the NBA finals. I think you both might, have. I know one of yeah, you did. And they're just not clicking right now. And yes, the firing of Adrian Griffin back in late January was a tip was a tipping point in something like why is a 31-15 team firing a head coach that got him there? Griffin was just not a guy who players responded to. Is it the right move? I don't know. And I think it, it's it's a shrewd move. It's a dangerous move. But overall, uh, there's just no defense on this team this year. And that's the biggest problem of everything. Like, Damian Willard is a great player, not having his best year, even though he ended up being and then even though he ended up being an all-star. But this defensive team's rating has gone from what was a top five defense last year to pretty much like around the late 18 to 19. Seven, and actually 17th out of 30 per 17 now? Player. Okay. So they're they're back. They're not great. And this is, that's, you have to be in the half, first half. You have to be top 15 to even consider yourselves, I think, in my opinion, as a finals contender, which this team wants to be. Uh, they don't have a lot of depth. I know they just uh, signed uh, Patrick Beverly, who decided in his first game, let me just take the clipboard and coach myself, like I always do. And they just signed to the Gallinari today. Yeah, that's, 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 that's a nice under the radar pickup, Rabbi. It's a huge, it's a huge pickup, and a guy who's going to provide scoring. But again, this team just—I feel like every defensive move that they've made, it's just taking a step back. It's one step forward and two steps back. They had held uh, Charlotte and uh, Denver to under a hundred points, and then they let up one twenty-three to Miami, who, by the way, was playing without Jimmy Butler. And then tonight, uh, playing, uh, letting up 113 to Memphis. Doc Rivers is 3-7 and seven since he took over as head coach. By the way, he'll be coaching the All-Star team because he can't choose the same coach two years in a row. And that's the exact reason why, because at that time when they needed to choose somebody, he was in second place. Imagine, it would have been Jamie Bickerstaff possibly also, too. Go figure. But... Uh, there's something wrong with this Milwaukee team. I understand the reason to go to Rivers because you needed a guy with experience to kind of calm down this team. That hasn't happened yet. This team has been just in bad shape and in bad games. And I think it's going to be very interesting to see going forward what this team does. I think they can they can turn it around. I think in playoff times are going to be tough. Again, the Cleveland, they're fundamentally the most talented team out there besides Boston. They may not have the best depth, but they have the best one-two combination. 
something has to give with this team now. The firing of Griffin, again, was shrewd, but considering the power that he wanted and the basically forcing out of the most experienced assistant coach that he had in Terry Stotts in the beginning of the year, uh, this Milwaukee team has more problems than we think it does. The net, the record does mask a lot of things. This team needs to be one of the best considering the roster that they have and having one of the best shooters in the world and probably the most talented player in the world, if not Jokic, it's Giannis. Uh, this team is just kind of puzzling to me this year. I expected a little bit of a defensive drop. I didn't expect this. Yeah, I, I, watching them tonight, the something is all, definitely off of this team. The body language on this team, like especially watching this game against Memphis, it just looks so off. Like think about last year, what what when they were winning sixty games, and it's even it didn't matter who was on the court, it looked like just a, a buck team that that believed they could just beat anybody on a given night. Tonight, you watch this team, and it's almost like. It's like they're playing on eggshells. Like you just like the the. There's the, a lot of expectations for this team. It's, it's, it's a lot of expectations. Box. It's a lot of expectations. Did the slightest mistake, and you see the the slump in the shoulders. It, it, it just there was something like this team just looked completely off, and it's been like this all season. I think it just because of the record, the guardianess, and the, the win loss record, and everything that happened with the coach firing. That it, it may be something to do with the locker room, the players. Maybe something the chemistry's not down. There was a couple of games we saw where Giannis and Miller seemed like they just take a turn to say, "Okay, you be the guy, you be the guy," and, and, and it just like I said, it just been a, a mismatch of of what on earth is going on. And I don't know if uh, a midseason coaching change is going to solve the problems. They got plenty of time, but. You know, you look at a game like tonight, and, and even the, the playing against Indiana, a team that they just have been a thorn in the, in, in the, the side of Milwaukee Bucks all season. Um, they play offense. Yeah. They play the offense just, that uh, they can't guard. Yeah. It, it is, it is my number to see what has happened with, a, with this Milwaukee Bucks team. And I don't want to force the issue too much more, but – Doc Rivers is a very good coach. Knows his X's and O's. One of the best minds in the game. However, if you're looking for a guy to motivate and lead a team in clutch situations, I don't want to pick the guy that's blown <laughs> two game that's blown a three two lead four times in his career, including just Ooh. last season. I when the going Look, gets tough, I don't know. I, when the going gets tough, I don't know if I want him as my leader. Here, here, here's the thing, and I and, and I understand where you guys are coming from. And, and Doc's, you know, Doc seemingly his inability to get past the second round of the playoffs, you know, over the last few years, you know, uh, you know that 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 kind of as that continues to happen, you know, that 2008 championship with the Celtics is kind of gets further and further in the rear view. But here's the thing: when your star players are feeling a disconnect with their head coach and are not feeling like he's communicating and he's effectively getting across his philosophy and he's, you know, bringing in a philosophy that doesn't necessarily fit the skills of the players that you have here, but you're, you know, he made, he made a, uh, he made the mistake, you know, we're, we're talking, when I'm talking about Rivers, we're talking about his predecessor. He made a mistake. Yeah, we're talking about Griffin right now. Him. Not Darvin Ham. Who are we talking about? Griffin, uh, Adrian Griffin. Griffin. We're Sorry. talking about Adrian Griffin. Um, Adrian Griffin. He made a, made a mistake that a lot of first-time head coaches do. You come in with your ideas of how – the ideas that you presented in your interview that got you the job, you know, this is my scheme. This is my philosophy. This is how I work. You try and do the whole forcing the round peg into the square hole thing. Um That's not necessarily going to work. And, some, and unfortunately, if you are – inarticulate about how you want these guys to play you can't effectively communicate your principles your scheme you can't get and you can't get these guys to buy in that's going to be a problem um as someone yeah. who played competitive basketball in a league for over 20 years and as and was involved in the putting of the roster together and getting guys who fit the way we wanted the team to play. I cannot undersell this enough. Chemistry 
is as important on a basketball team as anything. There's only five guys on the floor at any given time. If these guys are not in sync and if they're not buying in, then it's going to be a problem. No matter how talented they are, they will not succeed. And if, and the number one goal for the Milwaukee Bucks after, you know, continuing is, is keeping that championship window open. And to do that, Giannis Antetokounmpo has to be not only playing to his, you know, best ability, he has to be happy. And he wasn't. And he communicated that. And as much as I don't like in-season firings, I think the course correction was required because they were not trending in the right direction for a team that was that talented. Do they have some holes to patch up? Do they have, do they need to, you know, do they need to improve in areas? Yeah. But you know what? When you can score the basketball like these guys can and they're fifth in offensive rating per basketball reference in the NBA, you got to believe if they can get that defense up to, as you said, Rabbi, middle of the pack in the East, which as Anthony, as you said, is suddenly a lot more wide open than we thought it would be at the start of the season. Doc Rivers still has time to get these guys to no, where they I need to be. I completely the rest understand. It's going to be up to them. I completely understand, but I do think there's two things that, by the way, this team needs a Drew, a Drew Holiday like character. And, oh, yeah, uh, without a doubt. And I told you that's guys, something when I, I, made, I made no bones about saying, even though I think they can come out of the East, I said, without a doubt, their offense is going to have to go up because their defense is going to go down because you are trading one of the best on ball defenders in the NBA for a one guy more. who. One of the worst. Well, 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 won't necessarily fair. call him a New York City subway turnstile, but he's not much better than that. As I said on the show when we talked about it, Damian Lillard's best defense is his ability to drop 30 points on a given night. Yeah, and I think one of the things that uh, – two of the other things I want to say about the coaching hire, number one, Nick Nurse, his, assist, his boss interviewed for the same job, and it just seemed very weird. I understand stuff can happen in coaching, but – same philosophy is I, I just think you also it, you don't respond to a first time head coach more than you respond to that kind of head coach. And again, I think Doc will be fine as this team's head coach in the in, in the long run. But again, eventually this team is meant for the playoffs. Yeah. And, uh, uh, yeah. and I agree with you, Rabbi, a team that's a veteran team like this, that is this far removed from a championship and has one of the best players in the in recent history of the NBA as its focal point and brings in one of the best backcourt players uh, of his generation and you saddle them with a first time head coach not great but again first time head coaches can work all right i got to move on because uh we might talk more in this segment about the western conference have, have you ever seen the royal rumble I know Anthony has, but Jay has it. Uh, <laughs> uh, back, back when I was you, a lot you younger, you know. <laughs> you see it back in the day. That's essentially like that. As of Monday, 6.5 games separating number one from number eight. You want young teams like Minnesota, Oklahoma City that are overachieving? We have that. You want teams with championship players like the Clippers, Denver, and Phoenix? Kawhi Leonard is a champion, by the way. I'm not talking about James Harden. In his conference, though. The Clippers, but uh, <laughs> we have that. Do you want a great ensemble like New Orleans? That's here. Do you want a lethal duo, duo of Luka and a well-behaved Kyrie Irving? We got that as well. And oh yeah, the ninth and tenth seeds that I didn't even mention in there are the Lakers and Golden State. With that said, Anthony, which of these teams do you pick for on the rise? Uh, it's going to be the Clippers. I mean, think about Insane. this. Uh, Insane. Yeah. They were, they lost six straight and there was like, it, it, we, we were, they were getting criticized. Like, they were getting buried. Like, they were getting buried after they lost six six in a row and, and it had just required James Harden. And ever and, and since then they've won twenty eight the last thirty four games, including a couple behind victory last like in Golden State, uh, when they trailed by as many as thirteen at one point in the second half. Uh, you look at it like this though. They're they're since November fourteenth. They are in the top 10 of defense range. They're ranked seventh overall. They're the number one three-point shooting team in the, in the NBA. They're the fourth offensive ranked team in the NBA by far. Uh, and during the span, they're actually the top offensive team in that span, offensive rating 
at 124.1. Um, Kawhi Leonard has been healthy. That's been one of the key things. Uh, well, he's missed the last few games. Questionable if you're playing the All-Star game, but I think the Clippers would they, – they'll prefer sitting him out if they're going to have him the rest of the season. But he's an All-Star again. Paul George is healthy, coming back from that injury. Last year, he's an All-Star again. But the two guys I want to focus on and who has actually sacrificed the most as far as his success has been Russell Westbrook, who voluntarily – moved to the bench after the James Harden trade and has provided the, the Clippers with some kind with a spot plug and some firepower off the bench. But James Harden as well. I mean, you think about this, he's one of the highest efficient players in the pick and, in the pick and roll this season. He is uh, slid more into that role of facilitator that has actually helped out the rest of the offense. Uh, and Norman Powell has also uh, kind of gone under the radar as one of the better uh, outside shooting players in, in the league this season. Health is going to be a, a key with this team. And we've seen this time and time again, uh, dating back to when the parent of Kawhi Paul George Bush got together in the summer of 2019. Can this team stay healthy? And if they can do that, they'll. I, I can see them being a team that could be pushed to get to the Western Conference Finals. But again, Kawhi has to stay on the court. Paul George has to stay on the court. James Harden has to continue to embrace his role as a, as a facilitator, stay in shape as well, because that's been a bit mm-hmm. of an issue. And uh, and Westbrook has got to continue to be efficient off the bench. Um, this is something that 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 Coach Ty Lu has had to kind of figure out on the fly. It has been uh, tremendous to see the last couple of months what the Clippers have been able to do. They told it around. James Harden even said it himself. When they when they finally click, look out. Um, but when you look at the, but if there was a humbling moment, uh, was earlier this week they lost. They got they kind of got beat down by the Minnesota Timberwolves. So th- there was a weakness to this Clipper team, and that is the size up front. And they're going up against bigger teams. You know they struggled against Minnesota. They struggled against a team like the Lakers, who has size and length that can guard them. So that's going to be. Uh, and they also to a lesser extent Oklahoma City with the with their youth and athleticism. So that's those are things that's gonna be that's that you have to look out for in the second half of the season. How does the Clippers match up against teams that are bigger and longer than they are? And also that the health of this team. I mean, they we're gonna talk about in the next segment about this uh sixty five game rule. I, I know it's spoiler alert, but um with this team um, they're, they're gonna have to be be a little careful as far as how how much they push the star players. I know they they want you want to prefer a first round matchup. You can try to get that one seed. They're not they want to strike a distance. You, and as bad by said it, six and a half games separate one from eight. Uh, and the Clippers are in a good position. They they're all patient. Sixty wins. So um, they were they were a, a team to watch in the, in the second half of the season. But those two things are going to be the, the question marks. Uh, if they can answer it, don't be surprised if the Clippers are one of the, the NBA's final four comes June. Uh, late May, I should say. Yeah, Anthony, you, you talked about, you know, uh, about Westbrook accepting his role. And I, I just took a quick look at his uh, his um, his numbers. And, now, you know, he's he's, you know. We all know that like Russell Westbrook's not the greatest shooter, so I don't even look at his shooting numbers. But just in terms of making sure that he's, uh, you know, not jacking up threes at a ridiculous rate, and he's not. Um, but what's interesting to me is when you compare his per thirty six numbers alongside Harden's. Harden per thirty six, eighteen point two points, five point three boards, eight point seven assists. Westbrook per thirty six, seventeen point seven points, eight point four rebounds, seven point two assists. So if you prorate it, Westbrook is giving them exactly what he would if he was a starter. So he's playing within himself and still giving the Clippers exactly what they need coming off the bench. And that's to that that's kind of impressive to me um, because we all know how, you know, <laughs> we all know what we, we, we talked ad nauseum on this show about uh Westbrook thinking he's still uh, Mr. Triple Double when he no longer is at the stage of his career. And, and the irony is that the the issue with him falling out with the Lakers was his 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 unwillingness to 
accept his accept role. Accept a lesser role and come yep. off the bench. And with the Clippers, it's his last season, really. He's been more of a, a seeming fit for the for that team and that second unit. Mm-hmm. I think his Lakers stint humbled him, by the way, a little bit. And I think that's kind of one of the reasons why we are where we're at right now with Russ. And uh it's been very interesting seeing again how this started when Harden was traded to them, uh and ha- how it's going. It's like yeah. that team. How it started and how it's going. However, they're still third in the Western Conference, despite a 36-19 and 19 record. Minnesota is number one with a 38-16 and 16 record, kind of a surprise. But, Jay, with the trade deadline moves that Oklahoma City made, they were already good. They're now, right now 37-17. and 17. They might be well poised for a Final Four run themselves. Yeah, you know, I mean, they, they, they didn't, you know, they made some minor moves like a lot of teams seemingly did, you know, shuffling guys in and out to, you know, create – second round picks and trade exceptions and, you know, improve salary cap situations. Um, but the, the one thing that I thought that I think has the potential to pay that has a high ceiling in terms of what it could give them, but was a low floor in terms of the risk, basically what they give up to gave up to get it was them getting Gordon Hayward um, from the Charlotte Hornets. Here's what they gave up to get him. Trey man, Davis Bertrands, um, a European point guard who's been stashed overseas basically since they got him. Uh, Cash, a 2024 second rounder and a 2025 second rounder. I mean, in a very con- highly con- tightly contested top half of the Western Conference, the top four of Minnesota, OKC, the Clippers, and Denver are separated by two games. The right addition could make all the difference in the Thunder acquiring forward Gordon Hayward from the from the Hornets for what amounts to three end of the bench players in those three guys you know um none had played more than 30 games and only one was averaging double figures in minutes per game when he played plus two of the thousand you know second rounders that OKC GM Sam Presti seems to have laying around the actual number is 21 that were actually eligible to be traded per ESPN Bobby ESPN's Bobby Marks plus some cash is the type of low cost, potentially high reward move that Presti seems to pull off better than any other GM in the NBA. However, the problem with Hayward is that he hasn't been able to stay healthy. He's missed an average of 28 games per season due to injury in his three plus seasons at Charlotte. And he hasn't played since December 26 with a calf injury and won't come off the injured list until after the all-star break. Though, according to his former coach in Charlotte, Steve Clifford, Hayward was pretty close to being able to come back. Hayward may be far removed from his halcyon days of yore in Utah, where he averaged 76 and a half games played, 35.4 minutes per game, 19.2 points, 5.1 boards, and 4.1 assists as the starting small forward from 2013-14 to 2016-17, before injuries robbed him of his potential to be more than just a one-time All-Star. But if he can get healthy and stay that way, then he gives OKC an additional experienced secondary scorer, ball handler, and playmaker who can take some of those burdens off the starting backcourt of all-star point guard Shai Gilgis-Alexander and shooting guard Josh Giddy. Now, Hayward's game works equally well whether he's a starter or if he comes off the bench, and it seems to, and he seems to fit OKC's scheme of space in the floor with skill even if it's at the expense of some size. The Thunder's regular starting five of Lou Dort, Chet Holmgren, Jalen Williams, Gideon, Gilgis Alexander has played the second most five-man unit minutes so far this season. And of the top 10 five-man units in the NBA in terms of minutes played, the OKC starting five, their offensive rating of 118.7 and their defensive rating of 111.8 are both six. So I can see how OKC wouldn't be inclined to change that. Six foot eight, Hayward's bigger than some of the Thunder's other forward options without any loss of skill. He was averaging 14 and a half points per game, 4.7 boards, and 4.6 assists while shooting 46.8 from the floor, 36.1 from three in 31.9 minutes per game in the 25 games he, that he did play, all as a starting small forward before getting hurt in Charlotte. Now, while his usage rate has dropped to around the NBA average since the turn of the decade, Haywood remains a solid three-point shooter and playmaker. His 5.2 assists per 36 minutes are a career high and no doubt something OKC saw as valuable as this young core heads towards their first playoff run. And having his career per 36 minutes scoring average of 17.9 points per game coming off the bench should improve the offense of the Thunder's second unit. 
The thing about Hayward is that OKC has enough depth to weather any further time on the injury list that he may need post-All-Star break, especially since they didn't have to lose any of it to acquire him. Hayward's expiring contract makes the trade even sweeter for the Thunder, as Presti can re-sign him at a reasonable price or move on from him after this season. Just another shrewd pickup by OKC. Uh, it's a shrewd team. I love this team so much. I wanted. I would love to talk more about them. Um, I, I love the Western Conference this year. Pretty simple. And one of the funny things is, and knock on wood, there have been no tantrums. There have been no problems with this Western Conference. And mostly everyone has stayed healthy. The only real injury was the injury from the beginning of the year for Bradley Beal. And now he has been consistently back at the lineup for Phoenix is doing pretty well. With that being said, let me tell you how some of the sauce is made on this show. I had no effing idea who to pick for Team on the Decline because <laughs> in the top 10 right now, all of them are pretty good. It's Utah's kind of fading a little bit, but let's face it, it's Utah. I love that team, but they are still Utah. Mm-hmm. And Houston is a team that I can't really talk bad about because they are fun to watch and they have a good nucleus. So I decided to settle my <laughs> hatred for the Lakers. <laughs> and that's not a good pick because they're seven and three in their last ten, and they're now at a high water mark at thirty and twenty six. The one funny thing about this is LeBron James is obviously a uh, unicorn one of one, playing as the oldest player in the league officially this year. There is no player in the league that is older than LeBron James and is still playing at a great rate. And oh yeah, what about Anthony Davis for a second, who? has been great all year, has played 52 out of 56 games, and is just averaging 24.9 points and 12.2 rebounds a game. I think we kind of take someone like Davis for granted, but he's having a great season. And then, but this team has also played 16, one six different lineups in just 56 games. They finally have seemingly gotten it right taking Tori and Prince out of the starting lineup <laughs> and uh, putting in um, Rui Hachimura, who just scored 36 last night, and allowing them to beat the Jazz on the road without LeBron James. Hachimura is going to be a very huge part of this team going forward. Hasn't really done a, really a lot this year because he hasn't had the minutes. They're the number two uh, offensive league, by the way, since that shift. And the lineup of... When they're healthy, and uh, the only loss that they've had in the last five is without Russell. But uh, Hachimura, Austin Reeves, D'Angelo Russell, LeBron, and Anthony Davis has outscored points by ten point has outscored opponents by ten point three points for one hundred possessions this season. Which comes to the point for the team that me and Anthony picked to win the West this season. Why? How much more can they do? They're thirty and twenty six. Their offense is almost, uh, you can spin a wheel and guess where it's going to be from game to game until this run. And they've had relatively healthy seasons from their two stars. And they're still three and a half games (laughs) out of a regular playoff spot in the top six. I'm not sure what the Lakers can do at this point. And they might be able to get themselves back through the Western Conference Finals from the play-in, but... With teams, with almost <laughs> everybody overperforming this year, like Minnesota, Oklahoma City, I haven't even mentioned New Orleans, who's had one of the best lineups in this league, Dallas, who has actually got Luka and Kyrie at their best this season, and even Sacramento, who is a little bit falling down. They're 5-5 five and five in their last 10. What I don't know what openings the Lakers have right now, and I don't think oh. they can make a finals run again at a 9 spot, especially. Anthony, yeah, I feel I, like I you have say, something to say on this. Yeah, I would say this. That if you want to look at the Lakers, they've been at the model of inconsistency all season. This is a team that won the playing tournament and was looking really good, and then suddenly they just couldn't win games again. But, yeah, Darwin Ham, the, the, the lineup shuffling, uh, they have got some grumblings on the Los Angeles. Like, this is caused the inconsistency and with the minutes and player roles that's being part of it. They lost some key guys on the uh, – on a, the role players. Uh, Game has not played at all this season. He's been, he was a guy that just signed off the Miami Heat last year. But when you look at the Lakers, and, and I think back to last season, they were 13th in the West around this time a year ago. Um, It could be like, it could be a case of the, the rest of the field coming back to them rather than the other way around. We saw last that's year. That's the only the thing Lakers, that's going to have to happen, the by Lakers, the way. 
Yeah, the Lakers went 17 and 5 the rest of the way, and everyone in the West went backwards. That allowed us to kind of climb up the ladder. We might see that again this year when you think about Sacramento, a team that looked so good last year, being inconsistent now. And the Mavericks, when they, they can't keep their star players on the court for more than three games at a time. Um, and, and Phoenix, and Bradley Bill left the, uh, the game again. He just can't stay healthy. So you have a, a situation where the Lakers, they're playing better. They need to get healthier. Uh, Darwin Ham, you can stop playing Russian roulette with the star lineup every <laughs> other night. That'll help. Um, but the team, but you look at the, the sometimes you don't have to chase the rabbit. You let the rabbit come to you and come into the trap. Uh, I don't know if that's even a, a great analogy, but I'm just throwing things on the fly. It's better than the one <laughs> analogy that you just made a second ago. Well, yeah, I mean, but, I mean, the Lakers right now, they're doing enigma. They've been that way all season long, and, and they're, they're going to be enigma the rest of the way. And can they make another run after Ooh. playing? Who knows? But when you have the broad and AD, you always got a shot. And don't look now, guys, but uh, the Golden State Warriors are, 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 are lurking in the Lakers' rear view. Um, they, they, they've, what, won six out of their last eight. eight. Uh, uh, they're they're – they're finally they may be starting to finally figure it out. Jonathan Kaminga has been on a tear, averaging oh well over almost 25 points a game over his last few games. He's he's finally developed into what, you know, uh, to a point where Kerr is like not only feels comfortable putting him out there, but feeding you tell him guys, get the kid the ball. I think Clay Thompson is finally get a place where he's maybe figuring it out and by that i mean accepting that you know if he has to play a lesser role in order for this team to be more successful he's been says he's willing to do that steph curry's eternal we know that so uh yeah it's a very it, it's a very interesting year in the western conference because there are so many teams who you know rabbi you talked about it. the first eight are separated by what four games uh, you know, and there's the, the log jam after that in the in the, you know, when you get into the, you know, the play in area and right around that um, second half in the Western Conference is going to be very, very interesting. Just the fact that the Lakers and Warriors could possibly meet again in a elimination game yep. if yeah. the season ended today is kind of shocking. Yep. That's right. By the way. By the way, the key to that playing tournament is you want to fall in that seven to eight matchup because it needs to get two chances to get in. If you're in a nine and ten, you lose one time, season's over. Yeah. So there is a caveat to the playing tournament that you have to take into consideration. And you and you have to play that second game on the road no matter what, too. All right. <laughs> not, not sure. All right. So to end tonight, I have a little bit of a rant to get into this final topic. There are ideas that I would consider good in theory and bad in practice. Staying one staying for one more drink. Eating dessert after a big Valentine's Day dinner, doing two podcasts in the span of four hours and 13 minutes. Yep, four hours and 13 minutes. Well, now let me give you another one of those to uh, start this off the 65 game rule in the NBA. What was once the creation of a rule by Adam Silver to prevent players from having rest and rust? By taking away that day, by taking away the dangling carrot at the end of the season reward of awards. Has turned into a little bit of a mess. The idea just hasn't taken off. Just take a look at the case of Joel Embiid before his knee injury. His MVP status was still in question due to making sure he was healthy enough to get the Sixers to a title run. Now, whenever Embiid comes back and he plays like the best player in the league like he had in the beginning of the year, no matter if he scores 60 points a game, no dice, no postseason award, move on. Pacers all-world guard Tyrese Halliburton may not be all-NBA if he just misses three more games. Due to that unfortunate circumstance, his max extension will be worth $40 million less than what that kicks in next year, that is. And with that language in a lot of contracts these days, play well and be rewarded. What a concept, I know. Many players might do more to play when they shouldn't, especially when financial compensation or benefit might just be on the line, your livelihood. The number of players who might be affected in this role play 65 games to get to an award possibility, and thus making awards 
now as much as getting that perfect attendance mark in school, which doesn't do anything. I'm telling you right now <laughs> that it is about this achievement. The following players are already halfway to the 17 games missed mark. And remember, some of these games at the end of the season may not mean as much. Donovan Mitchell, Devin Booker, Lori Markkinen, Tyrese Halliburton, Christoph Porzingis, Jamal Murray, Jimmy Butler, and even Anthony's favorite, Kyrie Irving. I don't need players sacrificing their team game for the personal gain that they would get in the postseason. You're sacrificing these teams for the sake of maybe getting fans to be a little bit happier. Oh, yay! I saw Bradley Beal in one of the 10 games he played this season. Sorry. But I'm sure I would rather have Jalen Brunson healthy for the postseason run than to see the eyes of little Timmy from the Bronx happy that Jalen is even in a game for 24 minutes on an injured ankle just because I came to see Jalen in person. Anyway, Adam, baby, loosen up the rule. I want the <laughs> best players getting rewarded at the end of the season, not just the ones that just had injuries at the wrong time. You know, uh, when 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 Rabbi and I were putting this show together, I, I had uh, I had thoughts on, on the closer, but uh, I got to say when he when he pitched this idea to me, I'm like, yeah, we 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 kind of have to. You know, you you mentioned Embiid, so I mean, I'm not gonna dive too much into that. But I mean, you know, you know my feeling on that. Um, so, but I mean, I, I understand where Adam Silver is coming from with the 65 game rule, wanting to get the association association back to uh. We're an 82 game league frame of mind after all these years of load management where star players, the ones the fans come out to see, we're sitting out so many games of players. Now, here's the thing. Players must be on the floor for just 20 minutes in at least 65 games to be eligible for regular season honors, including MVP and the three all NBA teams miss 18 games and you're not eligible for any of it on the surface. It makes some sense. And there is some wiggle room in what the union and the league agreed to as part of the new CBA, which went into effect in July. Such protections against season-ending injuries. You play at least 62 games, you're eligible. Near misses in minutes, you can account, you can use two games of at least 15 minutes towards your total and bad faith circumstances. This comes on the heels of the NBA in the person of executive VP and head of basketball operations, Joe Dumars, saying back in October that load management is no longer supported by scientific data held by the league and that the NBA needed to get back to that culture of players doing everything possible to play in as many of the 82 regular season games as they could. Dumars said, quote, before, it was a given conclusion that the data showed that you had to rest players a certain amount and that justified them sitting out. We've gotten more data and it just doesn't show that resting, sitting guys out correlates with lack of injuries or fatigue or anything like that. What it does show is maybe guys aren't as efficient on the second night of a back-to-back, -back, you think? Um but considering how often winning these awards or making those teams is tied to bonuses and contracts, I have to wonder if in the larger scheme of things, it was the right move. Exhibit A for this, as Rabbi mentioned, is Pacers star guard Tyrese Halliburton, who missed five straight games due to left hamstring strain. Under the new 65-game rule, if he misses more than three more games for the rest of the season, he'll no longer be eligible to make any of the All-NBA teams which, as you said, Rabbi, could cost him a multi-million dollar bonus. Halliburton wasn't shy about his feelings on the rule, saying recently, quote, I think it's a stupid rule like plenty of the guys in the league, but this is what the owners want. So as players, we got to do our job and play in 65 games if we're able to. He's not the only one. Every fifth-year player coming off his rookie contract could lose out on big money due to this rule. The CBA states that such players can be paid up to 30% of their team's salary cap instead of 25% if they meet the higher max criteria during the last year of their rookie contract. The criteria are being named regular season MVP, defensive player of the year, being one of the 15 players selected to the three all-NBA teams. Considering that in December, Halliburton joined Hall of Famers Magic Johnson and John Stockton as the only players in NBA history to put up consecutive 2020 games in points and assists in an all-star season where he's averaging a career high 21.9 points per game and leading the NBA with 11.7 assists. He has a pretty strong case to be all NBA, but this rule could render him ineligible. Then there's the case of, as Rabbi alluded to at the top, of reigning NBA MVP Joel Embiid, who is now out for an undetermined period of time 
Doctors won't even reevaluate him for at least another four weeks after having knee surgery after getting hurt in Philly's loss to the Golden State Warriors back on Feb 7. The locker room after the game, there were plenty of his Philadelphia 76ers teammates who wondered aloud if the 65 game rule puts undue pressure on stars like MB to play when maybe they shouldn't and thus contributed to their franchise center getting hurt. You want the best players, hell, most of the players, to be able to suit up for as close to the full 82 as possible? Then you have to do something about the schedule. As much as players may want to reduce the number of games, the owners aren't going to do it unless the players take less in salary and the union won't go for that. So what do you do? You have to stretch the 82 games across more than 174 days. Doing away with the whole four game and five nights thing was a great start, but players still feel like there isn't much time to rest and recover between games, especially with the travel. Granted, they all fly charter on pretty nice planes, but air travel is still air travel and it still takes its toll. Start the season earlier, change how road trips are done. Put in more off days, something different has to be done. The 65 game rule may have been may have had the best intentions, but we all know what the road to hell or the injured list is paved with. Yeah, it's an idea that was that was uh, in theory a good intentions, but in execution poor and very poorly. Um, by the way, in a season where you introduce a playing tournament on top of it, so I mean that's just another caveat to all this. Look, um, I, I get what Adam Silver was trying to do because there have been complaints so many years about. Low management and players sitting out games. Uh, even yeah, yeah. Even or uh, uh, or even in a great case of a great Papa fish, right? Is someone that's missing a game is just being simply too old. Uh has a has a kind of the thumb your nose at uh at the at the league. But I have to remind the the, the younger generation, the younger YouTube generation, that when Michael Jordan played 81, 82 games on the regular season. You have to understand there was a story behind the numbers. The Chicago Bulls would be would have uh playoff position locked up so early that Jordan would start a game and maybe not play an entire second half, and that would go on for two weeks towards before the playoffs. So uh, those those are things that you you don't see in stats and numbers or on a YouTube video for the younger generation that the older players. They would sit. They would. They would sit out whole games, but they would literally like play one quarter, or play a half, and not play the remainder of a game to rest their the rest of bodies before a playoff a playoff series. And in this just in, in this case now that uh the sixty five games, yeah, you, you we mentioned Joel and B. It puts the players at a risk. Well, they kind of have to force themselves to play through an injury that they otherwise would would sit out and give themselves extra time. And risk a serious injury in the case of Holly Burton, you may cost a guy forty million dollars. And look, I'm a guy who love a big payday. I'm a guy who love a big bonus. Um, I don't want you messing with the. Ch- uh, I have a, a saying: you don't mess with the church's money. And and for the players, you know, this is a situation where okay, now you're screwing up potential bonuses, potential uh incentives that are in con- that some of these contracts. Because now you have a stupid uh, 65 game rule that I have to meet this criteria. Just to even, never mind win an award, just to qualify for that extra 20, 30 million dollars that I could potentially get in the next con- next uh, contract. Uh, this is something that I don't think the rule is going away, but I think it's definitely something that the league and the players' union is going to have to take away a little bit and maybe kind of smooth it out a little. Uh, so that we don't have a situation where you have a player playing on a, an injury, potentially risking a further serious injury, um, just because they want to win league MVP or be in a running for a, a, a salary bonus. Uh, but at the same time, you want to encourage these guys to play uh, as many games as they can, and not just for the fans' sake, but also for the quality of, of, of basketball. I mean, you know how frustrating it is. To, to, to go late into the season and see guys sitting out and you got the you basically got uh, a G League game going on in the middle of an NBA season. Um so there's gotta be a balance that the league's gonna have the league and the players is gonna have to figure out with this the six five game rule. If it's here for if it's here to stay on top of the fact that you now have a, a playing tournament that's gonna be back next season, 
Uh, it's so it's for, a tournament, for, by the way. Not yeah, playing. it's even tournament. Yeah, um, it's even tournament. Yeah, and and, and they're playing tournaments. So there's extra games for, for uh, a handful of teams that they're going to play. So there's gonna be a, it's gonna be a balance. You gotta figure it out, and that's yeah, be because it, uh, that, yeah, the yeah, return, Anthony. Because as, as, as much as Adam Silver may want, you know, uh, is looking at it in terms of, you know, his broadcast partners, compl- you know, may complain to him or he hears fan complaints about, you know, certain stars, you know, sitting out national TV games or whatnot. And, and I get that. But here's the thing. As much as these guys don't want to lose money, you know, by, you know, when, you know, when they're, you know, you got bonus potential and it written into their contracts for these things at the end of the day. These guys aren't as concerned about how many games they play in the regular season as they being healthy to play as many games as possible in the postseason. Because, yeah, they want the money that comes with, you know, attaining those, you know, those bonuses of, you know, MVP, you know, and all NBA. Bottom line, these guys want the they these guys want to be holding the Larry O'Brien trophy at the end of the season. And that's what they're most focused on in terms of being healthy to play. So there's there's that short night side in this as well you should be more concerned with all of your stars being healthy and playing during the postseason as opposed to the odd you know as opposed to them sitting out the odd thursday night national tv game and tnt doesn't get to talk about them by the way I leave it to anthony to uh make a jordan to uh give the jordan truthers a little uh something on the way out the door for today <laughs> He played 81 games. Well, most of the games were in a half. Look at YouTube. Most of them are old, aren't old enough to realize that you do silly things. Yeah, and, and, and look, uh, I, was a, I, I was afraid I went to one of those those late season games where Randy Brown and Bison Daly is suddenly playing crucial four quarter minutes while Joy and P- and Pippen and Robin is sitting on the bench drinking Gatorade and laughing, and chuckling that. The guy in the third row falls down and drops his popcorn everywhere. They also, so, they also won those 68 games. actually happened, by the way. They also won 72 games regardless, and sometimes won with that <laughs> second unit, by the way. Yeah, when, you, when, you, when you've <laughs> wrapped up the number one seed, you know, by at by least way, five said, games with 10 to go, yeah. I can watch a lot of those games, too. How do you win 72 games with Eric? That's enough because we can go on all night. For Jay Kaplan and Anthony Strait, <laughs> I am just humbly Stephen Rabinowitz, neutral person of <laughs> everything and not a hater on the internet like Anthony is. YouTube.com slash on the sports lives you are. Let's uh let's let's not be honest. YouTube.com slash on the sports lives to watch us on demand. If you're watching us live on Facebook tonight at Facebook.com slash on the sports lives. Thanks. And at O N T H Sports Lines. Baseball season is coming up. So we're gonna have a lot more interesting baseball stuff to go on that site. Check that out on X slash Twitter. Uh, guys, we'll see you next time when it will be our spring trading show. It'll be either next week or the week oh, after. Baseball's back. Uh, yeah. Pitchers and catchers officially reported today. And in honor of that, I watched Moneyball again. Oh, uh, yes. Watch... It's a great movie, by the way. Mm-hmm. Watch Moneyball a lot. Anyway, uh, how could you not be romantic about all the sports lines? We'll see you next time. Good night, everybody. Good night, everyone.